my last, my last talk, as you can, <laughs> nothing to do with the activity in the night. <laughs> so welcome to this uh, Ramuth 101. So the 101s were introduced last year, and we always know Ramuth 101 last year, so I thought it needs to be Ramuth 101. It's sold out quite fast, and uh, most of you guys have, find, have made it, so I guess it was a good idea. Um, we only have one hour though, so we're going to try and discuss as much information as we can within that time frame. Uh, obviously, at the end of it, if you have more questions, there is no time left. I'm very happy to chat about the mood for a couple hours more outside, uh, so no worries there. Um, we're going to start talking about the history of our guys wanting to remove. regulation surrounding it, the way it's made, obviously the timing limited. We might not go as much in depth as I would like to, but I think I'd like we to try at least to give you a very good idea and some uh, and dispel some myth because there are a lot still surrounding uh, this type of uh, product. And then uh, at the end we'll do a tasting. I don't want the tasting to be a scientific tasting where we're going to you know the things about for 10 minutes and then try and see if we find some interesting words to use. It's really going to be about you and, and your relation to it. And I'd much rather if you have something to say about the product you're tasting than you say it than much rather. I've had enough of those already yeah. to, to get into my room and, and, and start repeating the same thing and repeating what they are The lineup is really fairly classic references. This is a one-on-one, so what we're really trying to do is approach each category with the, uh, a stellar, uh, an excellent typical example of, of each of the styles we're going to be tasting. Uh, just a short introduction, in case you don't recognize me, this is me. Um, I wrote a book called Errani Rodel Vermouth. It's unfortunately only available in Spanish. And it's actually unavailable in Spanish. It's, 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 there is no, no, no copies left, but we're trying to work on, a, on putting a lot of the English, uh, the, the content available in English on our website. It's called Vermouth 101. I know to do the seminar that's been set up for a few years ago. And with Martin Luther, I was a guy in my day we're going to try and expand the content. So maybe a few of the answers you're not going to get today, you might find there whenever we do it. You've got my website if you want to get in touch, Twitter, Instagram if you want one of those. Uh, if you are going to tweet. Obviously, I need to thank our sponsors, uh, Martini, Rossi, Mike Pratt, and Os Alpen. Os Alpen bringing some excellent Italian, uh, French, and Spanish uh, remove. Those are big players in the market. I'm not just talking about volume, but because they've been driven, driving the Renaissance, uh, the return of the history over the last uh, few years. Um, is really growing, it's not just a myth, it's just not brands talking, it's just not one tenders participating uh, <coughs> on the stuff, and the category is growing at 5% rate year on year, and it's uh, planned to be growing for the next five years and at the same rhythm. Uh, when most uh, countries see a uh, uh, decrease in, 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 in volumes of, uh, of sales of any kind of alcohol, One of the reasons why so many new firms are uh, introduced on the market. All right, before we start, this is the one-on-one of the one-on-one. I mean, there's just a few couple of things we need to agree on before we start talking about these three production, etc. Uh, so there are two things when we are looking at spirits or uh, aromatized wines or basically anything that's on the market. There's one thing that's a tradition where it's coming from, and there's one thing that's a regulation of the laws. Uh, we tend to also to think about the lows because at the end of the day the lows determine what you're going to have in the bubbles. But the lows do not necessarily come from tradition, they come from pressure from low groups and from the industry. So there is a difference between the two things and that's the difference we're going to talk about in further uh, when we get further in the presentation. But for me, when I'm talking about brews, I'm sticking to tradition. Regulation is obviously important, but we're going to be sticking to tradition. 
So traditionally, vermouth was considered a tonic wine, which is a word tonic that has positive connotations that you can't use anymore when you're mounting alcohol, but that's what it was, it was uh, considered as in the 19th century. Aromatized with wormwood, I cannot stress this enough, as there are a lot of vermouth from Hungary that have no wormwood, but wormwood in German is vermouth, so that's where the stuff is coming from. Um, other botanical fortified, so we are adding alcohol to the wine base, and uh, sometimes quite often. Now, the European Union regulations, and we are going to be talking about the US regulation in a bit, but the European Union regulations are the most important ones because, at the end of the day, everything we're tasting here is produced in Europe, and it's a European tradition. It just says aromatized wine, to which alcohol has been added. And whose character phase has been obtained by the use of appropriate substances of Artemisia species. So no mention of wormwood. Right? We'll discuss this a bit further. Just know that wormwood is part of the Artemisia species, but not all Artemisia, Artemisia plants are actually wormwood, which is where the detail is in the details. Right? We'll talk about that. <coughs> say a few words about the uh, aromatized wine family because a lot of people get that confusion where anything that's wine based and it's got plants thrown into it is removed, right? Uh, like, uh, I don't know, lilette is removed, beer is removed, limonette is removed. Uh, again, no, we're, we, in, in Europe we, we do have those different categories. The first one, the main one for us, especially today, would be vermouth which is aromatized mainly, but not only with wormwood. The name comes from there, as I just mentioned. The second category would be Americano, which is also aromatized with wormwood, but gentian. Again, the devil is in the details because a lot of vermouth would have gentian, but will not try to qualify as Americano. The uh, differences are uh, sometimes very small and sometimes only understood by Italians. <laughs> Basically, the Americano is called Americano because it's a vermouth made the American way with extra bitterness. Uh, quinquinas, or maybe the cinchona, from, we're talking about French quinquinas, uh, barro quinato, etc. So obviously, cinchona is the, uh, the substance that gives us flavor to tonic water. And then the last category, the last legal category, would be bitter vino, most of the time it was a gentian, but it's very generic. It's anything that's wine based, and that's actually uh, here. We're not going to talk about any of those. We're focusing on this. We need to talk about history a little bit. And if there is one thing we all agree on when we're talking uh, about Western civilization, if you're a Westerner, everything good comes from the Greeks. I don't know why. We're always talking about the reach probably because it gives us pedigree. Philosophers in togas and stuff like that. Uh, and so a lot of people are obviously saying that uh, the mood was invented by uh, Greek doctors. And specifically, we're talking about Greek doctor, one guy, Hippocrates. So you'd read a lot about, uh, oh, he was the inventor of vermouth in the uh, like 400 years before Christ. When you're actually looking for wormwood and wine in uh, the writings of, of, uh, of that man, the only mention you find is for a remedy that you would put if you had the moderates. So I'm not really a move, don't drink that. It's a woman, right? So no, he didn't invent it unless you think that the moderates remedies are, uh, you know, external application can be removed. <laughs> But although Hippocrates didn't have anything to do with it, it is true that the first recipe that we have of wine mixed with wormwood comes from another Greek doctor, Dioscorides. But much later, in the first century after Christ. And Dioscorides was working for the Romans. At the time, Greece was in the tradition of the Romans. So that's the good thing about Europe and Western civilization. It's not the Greeks, it's playing the Romans. And this is where this guy come in, Dolce Vita 3080 style. That man's called Apicius. Apicius. You may have heard of the name. Quite a few Italian restaurants 
use that name. I think one in the US, I'm not sure if it's Seeds of the Poor Man, for example. Because the only uh, cooking book we have from the Roman Empire bears his name. It's not him, he's not the writer, but he, he bore his, his name. Whoever collected the recipe decided to give it the name of the most fam famous foodie of the time. And the first recipe in the first book in section on aperitivo is a wormwood based wine, vino absinthe. So it's interesting to us because although we had the Greek before with the Oscarides, this was really much a medicinal wine. Wormwood is helping, is a plant that can have digestion. We know that our ancestors until very recently had digestive programs all year long, 24-7. So that's why wormwood and wine made uh, such perfect uh, partners. But since this is in a cooking book, and this is in the first section of Aperitivo, we know that people were not drinking this because they had flatulence. They were drinking this because they enjoyed it. And indeed, the recipe is interesting because he says you need to use a good wine. That the wormwood you need to put in it needs to come from a very local area, from a specific geographical area, actually the region near Cognac, which writing in Rome is like saying, yeah, this needs to be, the good, the good stuff is, is, it comes from there. So it's the taste profile. And the um, official also added flowers, so he wanted it to make more pleasant. This is very important in terms of finding the uh, closest ancestor of Ruth, but I wouldn't call that Ruth yet. We still have uh, a lot of things. <coughs> a lot of time to, if we could reach the birth of modern Vermouth, which more or less takes place in the 18th century. Again, blame the Romans that probably because of people like Apicio, foodies like that, there was a big decadence of the Roman Empire. Everything went to shit. And all of a sudden, people didn't need Aperitivo anymore because they didn't have food anymore. So <laughs> they didn't have to go over anymore. <laughs> Appetite if you don't have uh, the food. So, the tradition of mixing wine and wormwood went back to being a medicinal one. Especially in Germany, there was a big culture of preparing what they called Vormwood wine in monasteries. And then for centuries, the only recipes that you actually find in all the books that are published about drinks and medicine that are featured wine and vermouth are exact carbon copy of the Greek medicinal recipe. Which was not a very pleasant drink, I didn't say that before, which is not a very pleasant drink because it was just great must. They threw uh, wormwood into the grain must, the grape must, and let it ferment that way. It was not a distribution, it was fermentation with the pan, it was pretty rough stuff. Okay? But there are other interesting things that happen during all those centuries, and we're talking about 50, almost 1500 years, right? On top of the medicinal use of wormwood in wine, we have Hippocras. I don't know if any of you here is familiar with Hippocras. Again, the name Hippocras brings us back to that Greek guy, Hippocrates, which is one of the reasons why many people link uh, Hippocrates with, with vermouth. They think, well, Hippocras is obviously vermouth before vermouth, and if it's called Hippocras, it was obviously invented by Hippocrates. That is not true. Hippocras only appeared in the 13th century. It takes that name because to filter it, they used Malum Hippocraticum, which was a conic filter that they, uh, that they used to filter out the botanicals uh, from the wine. And the uh, accessory they were using to make the wine became the name of the wine. That's why it's called Hippocras. Uh, Interesting thing about Hippocras is that though Hippocras was made with whatever type of wine, didn't matter if it was red or if it was white, but he didn't have any herbs. To read it was a mix of herbs, that's not true. Hippocras wines were made with spices, exclusively spices. This was a stagious wine. At the time, spices were extremely expensive. They were coming from the Middle East or from much further. For example, nutmeg could only get it from one island near Indonesia which means that you get nutmeg in Europe, we go from Indonesia to India in boat, from India to the Arabic Peninsula in boat, from the Arabic Peninsula to the Mediterranean on camelback, from there on boat until Italy, 
and then from Italy to Germany, for example, again uh, on horses. So nutmeg was almost as expensive as gold back then. So when you were putting nutmeg or cinnamon or vanilla in your wine, you were saying, I've got more money than you in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this was the first step. To at the same time, we've got the monasteries and the particularities that are happy with just having this, and they develop a lot of complex formulas, especially once people uh, start uh, being able to get books after the invention of the printing press. It means that if you have well off and you can read, you can have someone in your house preparing some of those remedies. There's nothing easier than to throw a bit of uh, when we're into wine and infuse three days and that's it. So obviously the monks were not only there by the grace of God, they were also trying to make a living. They thought, okay, this is going to take some business away from us, so we better try and come up with stuff that are much more complicated to develop. Right? That's when they start developing proprietary formulas, like Chartreuse, right? Chartreuse was born as a very small elixir, concentrated of many, many plants, and still, you know, we can't just distill at home with 84 exotic plants, right? <laughs> and the idea was that it was going to be much more efficient, but above all, that you, the, the, the guys in the village or in the town don't make it, so they would buy it. I just mentioned distillation. Also, distillation was extremely important in the evolution. When you start using distillation, you can make stuff like chartreuse, but you can also realize that if you are mixing uh, wine with distillation, wine keeps uh, far longer. Because wormwood, on top of its digestive uh, properties, was also used to help keep wine longer, okay? Actually, uh, we all know that now we put ops in beer, but uh, for the longest time, plants like wormwood were also used in beer to keep, uh, to keep beer. But once you have found that the secret, the secret for everlasting wines is not throw uh, aromatics into it, but actually just put a bit of uh, fortification, that's how you uh, have sherry, that's how you have Madeira, that's how you have port. Well, if you're still going to stuff the, the um, aromatic herbs, plants into your wine, that's because you're actually enjoying it, not because you need to do it, okay? But that's also a an important point. When you mix all this, the tradition of uh, mixing wormwood with wine, the tradition of mixing spices with wine, the uh, proprietary formulas complex with a lot of ingredients and then you, do you have distillation? All of this together is actually what we have developed here. That's the moment. It's a very fast crash course from the history of 1500 years of, you know, that's, that's, this is the one. And when does this happen? Well, this happens in the middle of the 18th century. And why does it happen in the middle of the 18th century? Well, the conditions were there. We had been through all those places, but also <coughs> cities were developing, right? People had more money. And as soon as you get more money and you get more food, that's when you start having too much food. And when you start having too much food, that's when you need aperitivo. Right? <laughs> Which, when aperitivo culture started developing, was seen as the worst defiance ever. I mean, what, what is wrong with people? They need to convince themselves they need to um, you may have heard the story of uh, vermouth being invented in the city of Turin in 1786. Right? This is the brand that pushes that story. Uh, it is a fun story and it is a very beautiful story. I'm not sure if we have time to tell it. Uh, but it's about one guy coming from a small village and going to the big town and starting working in the back shop of a, a, of a guy making liquors and thinking, I'm 20 years old, but I'm going to invent the best product ever, using the best wine, the best pants, everything together, throw it around, blah, 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 this is amazing, what am I going to name this? My favorite poet is from Germany, it's called Goethe, so I'm going to use a German word and call this vermouth, in German, instead of putting it in a Right, so I've got my vermouth, what do I do with it? Well, the king is over there, I'm gonna go walk over and see the king, give him a ball. Do you like it? Yes, I like it. All right, is it your official aperitivo? Yes, it's my official aperitivo. This is how vermouth was launched. This is the story the brand tells. 1786, the problem with that story is that the word vermouth first appears in Italian in 1773, and the first modern recipe of vermouth appears in 1792, when our friend from 1786 was barely 16 years old. So, genius maybe, but you know. 
And when I call it first moment room recipe, that's because on top of wine we have and wormwood, we have spices. And we have sugar. And we have something that's actually thought to be complex and interesting to drink. You see that even before 1786, the word also appears for the first time in French. But the date of 1786 is still interesting because that's, that is more or less roughly when vermouth become a cafe drink in, in Italy. Why there? Well, they had wine, which is always good. They were very close to the Alps, which meant that wormwood had many more interesting birds. Not very far from Genoa, which was one of the big arbor for the Asian trade for the spices. And they had also a very long culture of distillation. So they had everything. And I think the most important factor is not the first three, is that they had a culture of distillation, they were used to work with herbs and to distill stuff. So the infrastructure was already there for the industry to be. And Turin was a very modern city, growing very fast at the time. There was a cafe culture, and people could drink from it there. Interestingly, at this time, you don't have people making or selling vermouth outside the city. <coughs> to make vermouth back then, producers could only make it within the city and sell it within the city, which meant they were buying the wine from outside. This was not free market back then. If you were bringing products from outside the city, inside the city, you had to pay taxes, important taxes. They would have to buy the wine, and in the back of the cafe, they would mix their own. Uh, that's how uh, the brand I see that, but it starts in the in the room trade for you know, like Okay. But Bermuda remain, remains discreet and local for the longest time, playing the French as always. <laughs> 1796 revolution, Napoleon, they come over to Turin and they fuck everything up. So there's no way you can actually export the stuff. Then the Italians, well, at the time there were no Italians, they were uh, Savoia from Piedmont. They control reactionary rea uh, reaction to the revolution, very conservative, so no free market, nothing. You can still not sell it outside. Meanwhile, the French, while they were screwing things up for things up for Turin, created the first French vermouth, which is one of the vermouths we're going to be tasting in a moment. All right, just to give you an idea. This is the geography of Vermouth. The stuff was born in Turin, right? And the French, they invented their Vermouth style in Lyon. We're talking 300 kilometers, both sides of the Alps. So it's pretty natural and local. And in, right in the middle, you have the town of Chambéry, which is where we have the first of our third style. Now, as we will see in the tasting, the Italian invented a style that's sweet. The French invented a dry style. And Chambéry, which back then was not in France, it belonged to the same country as Turin, because they were right in the middle, they invited, they invented a semi-sweet. <laughs> Geographically. All right. So that's 1821, when we have the first uh, vermouth production in Chambéry. The very important date is 1838, because that's when the economy is, there's a bit of liberalism in Turin. People can start actually setting up shop outside of the city, so it means you can expand your operation, but you can also sell outside of the country. Which is more or less at those days that a company called Cora is the first company to export vermouth outside of the country. So it took a long while. It took a very long while. And then in 1861, Italy, which was a collection of small kingdoms and dukes and whatever fighting against each other, and the Pope in the middle, they finally get their shit together. Unification, which is obviously when they become an economical powerhouse and have uh, international reach, especially because a lot of Italians at the same time go and live abroad especially in the Americas. And it is not uh, surprising then that a brand like Martini, which is to this day the market leader, was born shortly after that. The Spaniards always laggards 
invented the, their own vermouth in 1871. Because they got a, like an Italian king at the time. It was the, 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 the country was in such a mess that they went to hire an Italian guy. And so someone thought, oh, I'm going to make a vermouth and sell it to the Italian guy. And then two years later, the Italian guy says, fuck it, this is a mess, too much of a mess, I'm going back to Italy. Vermouth <laughs> state. <laughs> Another important date, 1881, that's when the first Blanc Brumut was formed. Because oh, today, we associate Blanc Bianco style with Chambéry. Uh, but uh, what uh, a house like Dolan, which is the style everyone knows, uh, was producing was not called Blanc. That's another house of Chambéry, come on, so we're going to have a day stop in a minute. Uh, they, didn't invent the technique, it's just because everyone was filtering everything, everyone wanted something clear. You even had white chartreuse back in the day, right? Well, they decided, oh, we're gonna try and do this with, with, with remove. And so they were the first ones to do it in 1881. This is very important to underline because if you're reading articles on white removes, black removes now, most people are saying uh, it was invented by uh, Gantia in Italy, which is total bullshit. Uh, but, you know, uh, Vermouth being Italian, we only you only give money to the rich anyway, so it's it's, it's logical that they would, especially in a company like Gantia, who doesn't do much business anymore. Now they can say, okay, we invented the stuff, and if they're helped by writers who don't really dig deep, they uh, achieve more sales. But they're really they're really inventive with those things. Uh, we're not going to be tasting any of those. But once we have all those three styles, which is the white removed from Chambéry, the dry removed from France, and the sweet removed from Italy, uh, and once the market is expanding, and once bartenders, especially in the US, start using it to make mixed drinks, uh, that's when everyone wants to do the same thing. There is a unification of the market, yes? Does, does that mean that Amaro's broke out from the same general family no. as Amaro's? Oh, wait, Amaro's are, are cousins, but they're oh. still in base. This is not Amaro as in Amaro. This is like vermouth with Amaro in it, okay? So in the 1890s, precisely because people in Italy had been drinking this stuff for a century and were starting getting bored with it, they went to cafes and they asked in cafes if they could get the stuff mixed, right? They would ask, uh, drop a few drops of Amaro, a few drops of bitter, a few drops of vanilla liqueur in it. And of course the brands being brands and being so intelligent, decided to actually bottle the stuff and sell it, which is how you get Punte Mes, right? Which is a vermouth with extra quinine, where you get Antica Formula, which is a vermouth with extra vanilla. Uh, th th that, that, that's when those, those brands were born. And back in those days, everyone was doing it. Now we only have a couple of brands, although more are coming back on the market. But, you know, at the time it was like the, the, big, the big train. While the Americans were mixing cocktails, the, uh, <coughs> that's the old American, the Italian version, right? But little by little, you know, it's only the best style that stay, and, and if what people are drinking are, is the classic Italian style, the classic French style, and the, and the Bianco style, it makes sense for an Italian brand to start produce, producing French style. If you're saying, for example, that people are make, not making cocktails with sweet vermouth anymore, and they're trying to use dry vermouth, and we also need a dry vermouth, we're not gonna let the market, you know, our market disappear. And that, that is an evolution that they place around 1910, which is actually when uh, red vermouth is born, more or less, right? Because we all assume that Italian style has always been red, but that is not true. For the longest time, most vermouth were more or less the same color, which will be the color of the first of your, the first drink you have. It was just the extract. Uh, we already spoke about the extract in a moment. And for some reason, around 1910, they started putting more caramel. The color of red vermouth is not from the wine. In most cases, it's from added caramel. That's when we started to talk about it also. Until 1905, you find that articles in the American press that talk about vermouth from Trinidad being golden colored. So imagine that your Manhattan back in 1905 had a very different color from today. All right, just to give you an idea, 
we had the two original styles there. The guys from Lyon and Euphrat, they moved to Marseille, and then the Spanish trade center around here. Right. Still, it's much bigger, but still not a very big, it's still a very much Mediterranean uh, tradition. <laughs> <laughs> so, the low is very quickly. Um, this is the European regulation, and it is as sexy as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got some important information in that. The European law says that what you have in a bottle is minimum 75% of wine. 75%. The alcohol volume is no less than 14.5 and max 22%. Which means that on some markets you see vermouth brand selling at 14.4. Those cannot be labeled vermouth. Uh, they also define the sugar quantities, but the only one that's really interesting is extra dry and dry because those are the only category that actually use sugar level on the label. So extra dry will be less than 30 grams of liter, and dry will be uh, less than 50 grams. You have semi-dry, semi-sweet, sweet. For example, to have, to have a sweet vermouth, you need 130 grams of sugar. Those are all sweet vermouth, but none of them put sweet vermouth on the label, so it doesn't really matter. It means that they can have 120 or 180. In the US, in the, US the, the law is much more interesting. The wine must be flavored with flavoring materials. <laughs> <laughs> it should have the taste, aroma, and characteristic generally attributed to <laughs> Guys, <laughs> so obviously we don't have on the market a lot of non wormwood based vermouth, especially in the US. There are mostly there are actually aperitivo wines or aromatized wines that are released as vermouth because it's easier to sell something native vermouth than aromatized wine, right? Okay, so making the stuff. Obviously, each house has its own proprietary formula, and everyone does stuff a bit differently, but this, those are the meaning of basics, right? Of course, you need wine. As I said, 75% of the 75% is wine. In most cases, the wine will be white. Now, we're seeing a few red wine base removed, but red is more difficult to work with. It's tannic. It doesn't respond so well to the aromatization process. What you're looking for is a white wine that is a good quality, but it's not very expressive, fairly neutral, good acidity. Because the wine, this is changing now, but the wine, for the longest time in vermouth, is just meant to be a platform for the aromatization. Right? How do you aromatize it? Well, of course, a lot of botanicals that you extract, that you need to extract in stuff. Most people would think, the botanicals are extracted in wine. I'd rather take questions at the end. Most people would think that uh, the extraction uh, takes place in wine, but let's imagine a group like uh, Maltini, for example. They probably produce 120, 130 million liters of vermouth a year. It doesn't make any sense to have that amount of wine sitting with botanical in into it. Especially if you fuck it up, you need to throw everything away. So, so. The easiest way for everyone has always been to do a, a, a very concentrated extract that you use a mix of water and alcohol, about 50 percent, throw your products, your botanicals into it, right? A lot of the brands will just throw everything into that mix and wait for three to four weeks, pray that it goes right. Use that very intense extract to aromatize that wine. Obviously, if you want to do things a bit better, well, you have different sort of maturation depending on the ingredients, right? It's much faster to extract what you want to extract from a flower than it is from cinnamon, okay? But we don't really have the time to go into the details of this. Just, uh, just know that there is an extract that's very, very intense and that that extract maybe makes for one to two percent of the mix, okay? It is that intense. In a one, in a one liter bottle, you get two centimeters max of extract. It's extremely bitter. Don't try it, don't taste it. <laughs> In most vermouth you have sugar. Most of the time it will be added. But there are also a lot of vermouth made with mistel. If you don't know what mistel is, it is just 
great much that you stop the fermentation by adding alcohol to it, which means you, you keep all the natural fruits of the grape, right? So once you work with this, obviously you've got different type of, of fruitiness, of, of, of sugar uh, in the mouth, and you don't need to add sugar. But even the dry style, I mean, most dry, for example, this one has around 30 grams, 30 grams of sugar left. So if we were talking about table wine, we would not say this is a dry wine. Okay. Some alcohol for fortification. The Romanic in us, we think this is a wine based product, so we've been fortified with grape brandy, right? Problem with grape brandy is it's very expensive. So we mostly see brands using grain alcohol, neutral grain alcohol. In terms of economics, and for color, you add caramel and burnt sugar, or burnt sugar. That's, that's where it comes from. Again, a very tiny amount. Some people think the sweetness comes from the ca caramel, but the caramel is actually bitter. So, the sweetness from the vermouth will always come either from the mistel or from added sugar. And of course, I cannot stress it enough. <laughs> Well, no one with no one, right? Which sort of mean we get a sort of uh, stomach, but I can't stop drinking. So, we could have done it in, in historical order, and maybe it would have made more sense for you guys to, to, to start it, you know according to when the style appeared, but that would have been moving from very sweet or very bitter intense to drier and go back to sweet, etc., which is not uh, the funniest uh, travel. So we'll, we'll, we'll go from the dries, from dry to, to, to sweet and from less intense to more intense, all right? So the first one, as I said before, that most of the reference we're gonna taste today are, are fairly common. This one is less so. It is available on the American market, but uh, normally what you see in American bars on is Noe Pratt Original Dry, which is a special version of Noe Pratt only for the American market. Uh, sorry, Noe Pratt Extra Light, that's what you'll see on the American market. This is Noe Pratt Original Dry, which is available in the US, but doesn't sell as much. And this is the original stuff that was invented in, in France in 1830. So go ahead, nose it, drink it, enjoy it, or not. Again, as I said, I'm not really looking for technical notes here. Just put your nose into it. <coughs> Tasting vermouth, especially red vermouth is here, very fun. It's fun and easy because you never can go wrong if you say it smells of oregano. <laughs> it smells of orange and it smells of cinnamon or vanilla. You never go wrong. So, you know, I don't feel like you need to come up with uh, earned tire or things <laughs> like that, right? But it's always interesting to see you know, if it's citrusy, if it's wine, if you get a lot of wine, if it's more herbaceous, if it's balsamic. In this case, I think you will agree. Well, for me, obviously, I'm, I'm not sort of used to tasting this one. But uh, you get more chamomile and more. Uh, Herbal profile, a bit of a certain dryness brought by some uh, some of the bitter bars that are used uh, in, in, in the vermouth. Uh, anyway, and I don't know if anyone noticed something a bit more interesting is going on, but from those very obvious things. It's great and wanting. But do you use this one or do you use the extra dry? Uh, yeah. That one. That one, the original, right? And you know your stuff. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so what's the difference between original dry and extra dry? Original dry, they invented the dry stuff, the dry style, which is why they can call it original dry. It's they take the wine that they use. They use a, um, to make this. They use a, a mix of wine, white wine, and mistel. The white wine spends the year in barrels outside of the uh, of the, uh, of the production facility. 
we're about 200 meters from a salty lake in the Mediterranean, right? So you get all the salty wind and hair. It's also the south of France, so it can get very hot in the summer. So basically it's a brutal process, which is a bit like uh, trying to turn your wine into Madeira. Sometimes, by white salmon, some people would know a bit of oxidation maybe on the nose. Once the wine has been through this, they refresh it with a mistel. Mistel, again, being great must, that was the start of fermentation, you have natural sugar, it's very fresh and fruity. So we refresh this mix. And after that, they will uh, put the, uh, in this case, they would, they would do the maceration in the wine. I said most people make an extract, they don't. They, make, they have a maceration in the wine. The problem with this beautiful product, that to this day is very much used uh, in cooking in France uh, is that the color is quite intense and when you make a dry martini the color is not the color people are used to for dry martinis and since basically dry roots are uh, only used in martinis right, people were starting to expect another sort of profile so now you try to put out the, uh, for the American market the extra light which has no color and doesn't go through that very process that you described. Obviously there are many more options on the market for dry vermouth. For example, uh, Dolin is a style of, of dry vermouth that everyone is going to go the bar will be familiar with, which doesn't give any of any color. And it was created uh, to, to, to dry martini that was created in Chambéry, right? But it was created much later than, than, than this one. Not the main uh, genre style. <clears throat> right, yeah. Invented by your French, perfected by your French, because unfortunately I know we have a few Italians in the house, but there are very, very, very few good uh, dry vermouths made outside of France. There are very, very few good dry, dry vermouths already made anywhere in the world, period. I mean, there are maybe three or four in the world. So it's, it's a very complicated style. It's having so little sugar. And that the aromatic profile is very difficult to add. Moving on to the number two. A common mistake for people is to assume that this, this snowy product is not red, it's also a, a blanc vermouth, a bianco, a white vermouth. But blanc bianco is actually not just a color, it's a category. So it's very important to make a distinction between what is dry and relatively colorless, and what is colorless, that's sweet, because as you will see immediately, even on the nose, you will note that what you're going to drink is sweeter than what you have to shoot for. Remember when you taste it, don't say, oh wow, this is very sweet. This, it's not that necessarily it's very sweet, it's the transition from one of 30, less than 30 gram sugar to something that's much, well not much, but that's high. So a lot of Blanco Bianco that are on the market will have a very heavy vanilla presence on the nose. This is actually one of the main effects of the style, too much vanilla and citruses. Here you don't really have that. On the contrary, the profile is still a bit herbaceous. And fruits, that's one of the things I prefer about a good brown white vermouth is that you've got stone fruits. You can have apricot, Orbit fruits that will shine through if it's a balanced one. As we're moving into sweet territory, the real question we need to ask ourselves is all right, it's sweet, but is it too sweet? How balanced is the acidity with the sweetness? You notice that there is no bitterness, almost no bitterness to this. To, to, to the white style, although this one has got a bit more than, 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 than what we had just before, than the night front. But it's not very intense, it's actually quite well rounded. It's something that would be very pleasant to drink nice As we mentioned before, this was invented, uh, this is the style invented and perfected in Chambéry. In 1881, they started producing what they called Blanc. We just, we just drink the, the Blanc Brut appellation. And that's what the Italians turned into the Bianco. Which is sort of fun because the guys in Chambéry started making vermouth after having discovered 
her move in Turin. And then the people in Turin invented their Bianco after discovering the stuff in Chambéry. And in 1980s, the category of vermouth that saved vermouth from going bankrupt because no one wanted to drink this stuff anymore was precisely the Bianco category, the Biancos uh, from Italy. So it's a bit like a snake biting its own tail or whatever. That's an interesting story. All right. um, Blanc, uh, for, for the longest time, people haven't had any, uh, used any Blanc vermouth in cocktails except the presidential <coughs> Cuba that was invented in 1915, around 1915, that was made with Blanc vermouth. Not with dry vermouth, not with sweet red, but with brown vermouth. Thankfully, over the last few years, we're seeing many bars uh, embracing the style, especially because it works very well. Uh, well, I think the people from Comos uh, mentioned that it works very well with uh, Scotch whiskey, but I, I have to think it works uh, especially well uh, with uh, tequila, Bianco's, Agnicole, Cachaca, all those white spirits that are very powerful in flavors, but haven't had any aging. They, they, their edges haven't been smoothed out, and that vermouth, that side of vermouth, really helps smooth it out. It also very works very well with other bitter ingredients because you still have a lot of aromatic complexity, but you're not adding bitterness to something that's already bitter. So it's very good. It, it works very well. Let's move on to number three, which is a vermouth that I assume everyone has had at least, at least once in its business life. <laughs> because that's a stalwart. That's, that's what everyone knows. Martini. Martini Rossi Rosso. It's easier in Europe, because in Europe we just call it Martini, we call it Martini. We don't have the double M and R. Um, so what you have there is not the original style of vermouth from Turin, it's an evolution of it. Obviously most brands will tell you we're always producing the same stuff, we've never changed. But there is an evolution, the wines are not the same, the spices are not the same, the lows are not the same, the market preferences are not the same. Uh, so it's a product that has adapted throughout the ages and that always remained the most, the most popular product. To the point that where today we have a lot of optional vermouth, but a lot of drinkers would say, especially in the US, this is not going to happen if I don't have this reference, okay? And this is where we get into the, there is nothing wrong about saying this as, a, that you never go wrong if you mention orange, if you mention oregano, if you mention salmon, if you mention cloves, if you mention nutmeg. Those are things you will always find in This is very Mediterranean, I think. A lot of aromatic <coughs> earth, which makes something pleasant and attractive for most consumers. So just consume it, obviously, if you're the market leader, because you please is the most people. If the, uh, the one before, the Blanco style, was more about the freshness, here we have more baked nose, more spice nose, more Christmassy flavor. Which is just as well, because this is a type of vermouth you expect to go against dry whiskey, for example. Right? You need, you can't have something that's going to retreat and need to leak. You need something that stands up. What are you going to mix it? Manhattan Negronis today, of course, those, those are the sort of drinks we will expect. In terms of bitterness, bitter, it's more bitter, more astringent probably than, than the white style. There is a lingering bitterness at the, uh, at the back of the palate, but it is not very intense. It's actually quite nice in the palate. When When the cocktail renaissance took shape, obviously a lot of uh, bartenders went back to classic formulas, and a lot of classic formulas of vermouth. But the vermouth we have today was not what we had back today, I'm saying 10 or 15 years ago, was not the vermouth that people were playing with 120 years before. Okay? So, more or less, when the cocktail things took off, well, some, some, some producers wanted to think that maybe we should reintroduce all style uh, uh, vermouth that would work well 
with the classic, uh, the classic cocktails. One of those houses is our, our most sample, which I think the first premium old style cruise known to the market was Carpano Antica Pondula, and the second was probably Cocchi Bermudito di Torino, the Storico, right? Which I think was launched 2009, 2011, something like that, more or less, right? So 10 years ago. Uh, where the Papa family, who owned the brand Cocchi, who is a, a, a brand from 1891, went back into their archives and the formulas to sort of develop something that would be closer to what was drunk uh, before. And uh, Roberto, who is at the back of the room, would be the first to tell you that it was very difficult at first because in Turin no one drank vermouth. It's an interesting thing that the Italian invented the stuff. They drink it in Iranese, they drink it in Americano, but not drink it straight. It was very complicated to convince people to actually drink vermouth on its own. I think the work was a bit easier in the United States where you drink it or anyway in cocktails. Go ahead. Here we have a lot of lot more complexity. I think vanilla is quite 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 obviously there. But cola. This is uh, so cola is something a lot of people will mention with 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 with, 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 with vermouth. A lot of it as uh, a root beer. In Europe, we wouldn't say root beer. We would talk also about balsamic nose. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you talk about uh, clove. You talk about um, oh gosh, in Spanish regaliz. Regaliz. Uh, yeah, licorice. Licorice. Right. Those are nose that we always find, we also find in 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 in, in, in coke, which. Which, which is why we're reminded of it. Although I'm, I'm not sure this is what we should say to a Vermont producer. <laughs> so why most Vermouth were made with neutral wine? Originally, historically, at first they were made with Moscato wine, which has much more personality, right? Uh, and and uh, I think in the case of Cocchi, well, they went back to that tradition of using Moscato it's, it's, you especially notice this in the mouse field, which contributes to the, to the perfect kind of sweetness without necessarily adding sweetness to it. Very rounded, like it, it fills your mouth, but still quite nice and fresh. And again, the bitterness is quite discreet, it's not too intense. Right. So, of course, this is perfect for Manhattan also. And this is Arting back to the style that first made Vermouth popular with American bartenders, which is a big part of the success of this type of bottle. Very, very quickly, because we've got five minutes left, and again, that's the same problem with me and Vermouth. It's like, I, I think I can't do a one on one. There's too much stuff I want to talk about. <laughs> very, 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 very short. Interestingly, there was no Vermouth cocktail at all in Germany's territory, as spoke from 1862. Not one. Not one. It was discovered by U.S. bartenders in the 1870s, and it became the trendy ingredient in the following decade, especially in the 1880s. But from the 1880s, it was all about sweet red, not yet, but what we know today as sweet red um, Italian style. And they transitioned into, in the 1890s, into the French dry style, which explains also the evolution from drinks like a martinez to drinks like a martini, okay? And which also explains why the Italians said, oh, we can't lose the market, we're going to do dry milk. By prohibition, if you took any uh, cocktail book, I would say 70% of the drinks might have vermouth in them. So, big difference. In, U in Europe, obviously, the American influence led us to use vermouth in a style more close to the American style, like Romanese, etc. Prohibition in both world wars hurt vermouth a lot. Big disruption to wine trade. And you guys got used to have very bad vermouth, which I think is why you started to have less and less vermouth dry martini. For me, a dry martini with no vermouth is not a dry martini, it's uh, a gin. Yeah, but I have too much respect for gin to call that gin. <laughs> and of course, the cocktail renaissance, as I said before, is also a renaissance with the category rolling. And I think the good thing is, although people are moving away from the classic and the speakeasy style of ours, vermouth is still there because it's a very versatile product that can be used in low ABP. 
It's a mouthful, but we have to do more drinks for this two days in three minutes. Uh, number five, those are the, the last ones to, to come to the game, 1871, from France and Spain. This one is from 1914. It is a style you will see. I invite you, for example, to compare it with the Montagny Rosso, because it's obviously the Spanish style, the root style is obviously an evolution from the Italian style, but it took its own way, because it had to be suited to different types of people. <coughs> but again, here we're gonna have the citrusy dog, here we're gonna have the orange. We also have the Mediterranean, Mediterranean herbs like oregano, but a lot of the time when you smell oregano, what you're actually smelling for some people is wormwood. We don't know wormwood, that's the problem. No one has ever, well, you have, you have. But most people have never tasted wormwood, right? So we don't even know exactly what it, what, what, what it tastes like. It's actually quite fresh smelling. If we compare, for example, for cocky, it's much less intense. What I like about this, for example, is that it's a very nice balanced acidity because there is very little bitterness, and so the sugar needs to be washed out by something. And there is a nice acidity. It's quite short in the mouth. It doesn't have a very lingering flavor, which which is not a criticism. It is not a defect. It's what makes you enjoy it over rice. You can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Which is uh, <laughs> but not enough. <laughs> So that's it. You can use it for cocktails, obviously, but you drink it straight. You drink it on top. You drink it with maybe a bit of soda water, but you know. And size of orange, but more, and just a bit of sun, not too much heat, you know, patio, and that's it. You're, you're good. All right, in 60 seconds, <laughs> 86, reserve of removed. So we've all seen traditional, <clears throat> traditional styles from, from France, from Italy, from Germany, Spain, Catalonia, etc. But of course there is a big challenge for a remote producer, which is there is a 21st century and people, there is an evolution of it. So you get a lot of weird stuff out there. Most of it really, really not good. Uh, but some brands have actually thought, okay, we cannot give up on tradition, but we also need to look at the future. And this, for example, is the case of Martini with Rio de Special. They have two, Ambrato and Rubino. Rubino is made with a bit of, of red wine. What we're having is Ambrato, where they also use Moscato wine just as cocky. But you're gonna see that it looks like a Bianco, but it doesn't have any, it doesn't, the profile is very different from the Comos. Especially on the nose, you see something that tells you dryness, a bit of sweetness, and it's a dryness that tells me it's going to be more bitter than what I expect of a, of a, of. But you still have those fruity flavors, right? It's, it's a mix of these. We still have that round essence, quite full in the mouth, a bit like a cocky, but less intense. What's interesting is it's very bitter in the end. It's probably the most bitter of the ones we've tried. Right. And that bitterness, lingering bitterness at the end comes from quinquina. Right. If you have bitterness at the end of the palate, it would probably be quinquina, chona, like Tony. In the middle of the mouth, it would be jet chan, and at the front and the back at the same time, probably. Okay? So that's it. They said it to drink with tonic, which makes a very nice, but in a very nice refreshing drink, but also for signature cocktails of the future, right? And I'm going to be one minute later. Because <laughs> I still need to say this at the very least. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it feels even to me very rushed. Uh, Vermis Future, as I said, it's a growing category, five to single over the next five years, so I just hope that this very limited uh, Die in the general world will actually push you to try and discover more. With a growing problem, which is when vermouth is not vermouth anymore, a lot of the new stuff that's coming out is actually really weird, nigh on undrinkable, and most certainly not vermouth. Of course, the future is held by the fact that people are going to drink less, so low or less boozy, low alcohol trend. It goes, as you all know very well, with food, especially the Spanish style. If you were at the Spanish Academy of Talk yesterday, I think we, we talked a lot about it. But, and that's a big, 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 big but. All right, people want our health focus, they want less out of gold, but they still need to talk about sugar. There's a lot of sugar in food. People don't realize that. I don't know if Coke, Coca-Cola has got the same level of sugar in Europe as in the US, but in Europe, Coca-Cola has less sugar than most rooms, right? 
And no one is drinking Coca-Cola for its as reasons, right? And yet people are saying, well, there's, there's less alcohol in the room. And so a lot of producers are actually working now on putting less sugar in their vermouth. But the problem is that sugar in vermouth is not, it's about balancing out the botanicals. And it also works a bit like salt when you're cooking. It helps make some flavor pops. So most of the people who are lowering the, uh, the quality of sugar are putting out vermouth that are undrinkable. I, I have tasted low, low, low sugar sweet vermouth that are awful over the last few months. But probably the guys who managed to have less vermouth and equal intensity and uh, <coughs> full mouth, you know, the, the full mouth aspect that sugar helps a lot, will be on the winner in terms of, 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 of sales. That is the big problem for, for vermouth uh, today. Most brands are being asked, why are you lower sugar? Well, it's not that simple. Okay? Yes? Coquille Americano is not a vermouth. It's an aromatized wine. Of another, it's another category that has like, wine and wormwood. It's vermouth. Wine and wormwood, the gentian. It's American. It's a very, very close cut. Uh, yeah, but the, the sweetness is often determined by, the, by the, the quantity of bitterness that you have in the extract. For example, the Spanish vermouth taste is, taste is probably sweeter than uh, other vermouths we've tasted and has less sugar. That's because the extract is less. Yeah, yeah, it's a balance thing. It is a balance. Okay? Well, sorry guys. Thanks a lot for coming.